Welcome back, mitochondriacs, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. Today, we continue our micro series into melatonin and start to get into its critical functions at a high level here. So, this paper is pretty cool because it's talking about melatonin as an anti aging molecule, but also about its direct therapeutic implications for cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases, which, if anybody knows, anything about the statistics and at least the United States, it's always cancer and cardiovascular disease is the number one and number two killer respectively. But neurodegeneration is exploding. The amount of cognitive impairment, the dementia, Alzheimer's disease, et cetera, seems to be hitting pretty much everyone's family hard these days, including my own. So there is a lot of relevance to this paper at showing how important melatonin is. So what it's saying here is that the concept of aging is defined as a set of gradual and progressive changes in the organism that leads to an increased risk of weakness, disease, and death. This process may occur at the cellular and organ level, as well as in the entire organism of any living being. During aging, there is a decrease in biologic functions and the ability to adapt to metabolic stress. General effects of aging include mitochondrial, cellular, and organic dysfunction, immune impairment, inflammation, or excess chronic low-level inflammation, leading to excess aging, oxidative stress, cognitive and cardiovascular alterations, among others. Therefore, one of the main harmful consequences of aging is the development and progression of multiple diseases related to these processes, especially at the cardiovascular and central nervous system levels. Both cardiovascular and neurodegenerative pathologies are highly disabling, in many cases lethal. In this context, melatonin, an endogenous compound naturally synthesized not only by the pineal gland, but also many cell types, basically any cell with mitochondria, may have a key role in the modulation of multiple mechanisms associated with aging. Additionally, this endoliamine is also a therapeutic agent, which may be administered exogenously with a high degree of safety. For this reason, melatonin could be an attractive and low-cost alternative for slowing the processes of aging and its associated diseases, including cardiovascular and neurodegenerative disorders. So one of the kind of areas of controversy that kind of two major figures within this space have talked about is, is melatonin able to be suppressed endogenously by exogenous or supplemental administration? And the reason why it would even be concerned is because most hormone loops, if you look at hormone physiology, will have a feedback mechanism that will shut down its production in some other part of the body. So for example, if I give you a bunch of corticosteroids like prednisone or methylprednisolone, solumedrol, et cetera, over time, I will shut down the signal from the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to stop making ACTH, which basically will atrophy the adrenal tissue and shut down its production. Same if I give you testosterone. If I give you testosterone, I'm going to shut down your endogenous production by the decreases in LH, FSH, halting production of testosterone in the testicles or the testes. So it would not be out of the question to be worried about a feedback mechanism that is directly related to melatonin. As we've learned pretty recently, melatonin is released on a circadian basis on a 24-hour light cycle that is critically important for clock genes, for your body to know what time it is, et cetera. So it makes sense to be concerned that, you know, exogenous administration of any hormone, but especially melatonin, knowing how important it is and how many important functions it is responsible for, could be of concern. So Dr. Cruz, for example, who some of you may or may not know, is an expert in many things, but he is very concerned that we should not be taking under normal circumstances any exogenous melatonin. And I tend to concur with Dr. Cruz knowing what I know at this point, because first of all, they're supposed to be made on a very particular basis in particular locations. So what I would prefer for myself, people that I love, and anybody that I'm that's under my care, under most circumstances, I want them to have perfect circadian rhythms. So they're making their own endogenous melatonin at the right times at night. And I want them to have maximal amount of sun exposure, both UV and IR, because I want them to make their own melatonin in their mitochondria at the local level. However, I do believe that there are times, in particular with cancer, where the risk versus benefit of taking exogenous melatonin likely seems to be a net positive because you're able to give massive doses of melatonin. And we'll talk about melatonin's action against cancer in future videos. But, you know, some of these doctors, these integrative oncologists are giving like 120 milligrams of melatonin, which is a giant dose, like four times a day. And seeing 
clinical results from it. So I'm not saying to do that. I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm just saying that that is the amount of dose that these integrative oncologists are giving and seeing clinical benefit. And I guess those particular individuals are not really worried about the potential side effects of shutting down endogenous production. Now, Russell Reeder, who some of you may or may not know, is one of the most famous researchers in the world. I think he's at UT San Antonio. And I've listened to him in podcasts and I've read papers that their hypothesis is there is no feedback mechanism. So whatever you take, you can continue to make without any problem whatsoever. I do think that there could be a problem with timing. Your body knows you know, what it's supposed to be getting at a certain time based off of the light and dark cycles and exposure to certain wavelengths of light. So there could be a problem with timing. But, you know, again, we're talking about something as dire as cancer, potentially showing significant benefit, not only with melatonin, but as we've talked about with 2-hydroxy melatonin and some of its metabolites having a potent anti-cancer effect, maybe the risk is worth the potential benefit by taking kind of mega doses of melatonin. One of the other misconceptions is, and I've heard Russell Reader talk about this particularly because himself and his colleague take like boatloads of melatonin every single day, during the day, at night. And what they're saying is, even though many people believe that melatonin is inducing sleep, that is actually not true. What's happening is, is that melatonin is being released at the induction of sleep when there's darkness, but it does not induce sleep. And I cannot say that I agree or disagree with that. I trust Russell Reader because I think he's an expert far and beyond what my understanding of melatonin is. But I know of, of a lot of patients who feel sleepy when they take melatonin. They feel groggy in the morning when they take melatonin. So I think the jury may be potentially still out on that because there's the, you know, the researcher who's saying no, no, no. But there's all these anecdotal stories of saying that it does make me feel tired. You know, I personally will give it in a hospital setting to patients as a way to First of all, I'm trying to regenerate their mitochondria without them knowing it. But I also give it to them because I'm trying to avoid using like heavily sedating, you know, benzodiazepine type medications for especially the elderly population in a hospital. But I'll digress. So let's take a look at this diagram here. And what it's saying is there's direct exogenous administration, indirect exogenous administration. Okay, we have melatonin. And it's going to have a variety of effects similar to vitamin D. It's going to have effects on serotonin system. It's going to have potent anti-inflammatory effects on in inflammatory cytokines and interleukins. It's going to have effects on macrophages and the immune system. It's going to have an inhibitory effect on transition pore opening. That's important for preventing excess apoptosis. It's going to have a direct effect, as I alluded to in the last video, about cardiolipin oxidation. It's going to have an effect on the clotho pathway, which is an important antioxidant response element gene system. It's going to block the activity of NF-kappa B, which is an important pro-inflammatory gene product. It's kind of the mother of all inflammatory substances. It's going to have a positive effect on the NRF2 system, which is another of the major antioxidant response. And it's going to have blockade on several other pro-inflammatory events, such as amyloid plaque, excess nitric oxide release, inhibition of COX-2 or cyclooxygenase 2 enzymes and the NLRP3 activation, which is called the inflammasome. It's going to have effects on the toll-like receptors, which is part of the innate immune system. It's going to have effects on mTOR signaling, pro-inflammatory cytokine release, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see, these hormones are what they call pleiotropic. So a lot of medications that we give or substances that we give, we think it has pretty much one action. Let's use an example of ibuprofen. Ibuprofen has direct effects on cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, which are two inflammatory enzymes. And that is pretty much the extent of their mechanism of action. They block one particular pathway in our physiology to produce one desired effect to mitigate symptoms. However, melatonin, vitamin D, testosterone, any of these endogenously produced hormone systems will have effects on all kinds of things. We're talking diverse biologic systems between sirtuin systems, anti-inflammatory, the immune system, mitochondrial directly, multiple antioxidant responses, and multiple mechanisms even of its anti-inflammatory effects. And it has a, as you can see here at the bottom, it has direct effect on accelerated aging and age-related diseases, which all use these various mechanisms to cause disease as we get older. And that's kind of what this slide is highlighting here. You know, it's related to circadian rhythm control, regulation of hormone release, 
cardio protection, heart protection, vascular protection, neuro protection, brain and nervous system protection. It regulates metabolism. It modulates sirtuin, mitophagy, autophagy, suppression of mitochondrial dysfunction. It's going to modulate this ER stress response. It's going to suppress tumors. It's going to suppress inflammation. It's going to modulate the immune system so you can better fight off pathogens. It's going to have a very potent antioxidant response. Not only directly melatonin is an antioxidant, but it also signals through NRF and clotho pathways, the antioxidant response element, which we talked about in the past. So this molecule, this biomolecule that is created in your pineal gland, which used to be thought of as only created in the pineal gland, is created in every single mitochondria producing cell, and it can be augmented substantially when you get outside in nature, which is why I tell you that I don't want you getting vitamin D from a pill because not only are you going to make vitamin D all of its amazing analogs and metabolites, you're also going to make things like melatonin outside, which are critically important for the body's protection against disease and accelerated aging. So I'm going to end on this pretty cool slide. So melatonin can be shared between cells. As we talked about two videos ago, it can have an autocrine, which means that it will affect the cell that actually makes the hormone and it'll have a paracrine effect. And so it will diffuse into the microenvironment between cells and it will activate melatonin receptors and have direct effects on adjacent cells. One of the coolest things that I've seen that melatonin can do is that basically there can be a damaged cell and they can actually create like little bridges between a cell and actually donate extra mitochondria and donate melatonin to help out its neighbor, which is pretty fascinating. Let's say you have a healthy neuron and that neuron is surrounded by a neuron that has, let's say, damaged mitochondria and just overall is a damaged neuron. It can extend out these what looks like axons to adjacent neurons and share mitochondria. That's what these little pink blobs are. That's very hard to see, but you're just going to be able to share healthy mitochondria with those adjacent cells and then basically regenerate itself. So pretty cool. Whereas if melatonin is absent and it's not present, there's less donation of healthy mitochondria and there is no regeneration of mitochondria and there ends up being apoptosis or programmed cell death of the neuron, which can lead to neurodegeneration. I think this is a really neat process that melatonin and mitochondria both participate in. So I hope I'm beginning to make the case that melatonin is an amazing substance, probably rivaling vitamin D, which is hard to imagine. I think that there still needs to be a lot discovered with melatonin because one of the questions I have is, what is the point of nocturnal circadian release melatonin when you can make essentially unlimited amounts when exposed to sunlight and infrared light? Because it's a much lower amount in the bloodstream with the circadian rhythm release from the pineal gland compared to what is found when you're exposed to these light cycles. And I guess this is where Maybe it's not about quantity per se, but it's more about timing. I suspect that the darkness effect and the maybe very specific way, almost like bell curve and time that melatonin is released has a lot to do with the story, not necessarily just the sheer amount, but that is to be discovered yet. I hope I'm making the case that melatonin is an unbelievable substance and needs to be really highly regarded not only for the prevention of disease and the maintenance of health and as an anti-aging agent, but in therapeutic strategies and protocols by integrative functional quantum clinicians. And I think in this, especially as we'll see in the treatment of cancer, which I look forward to shedding more light to that story in the coming videos. So stick with us, fellow mitochondriacs, we're getting there. But as I said, during the vitamin D videos, it feels like it does a lot of injustice to these biomolecules, which are so unbelievable, which will never be able to cover all of their amazing effects on various disease processes because we're focusing on cancer. But I want to give you a little taste of how melatonin can affect everyone and really fit in anyone's strategy to maintain health. If you like videos like this, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time.